Wow, thank you so much. Um, it's really a pleasure for me to be here. Um, I apologize in advance. You, you, you'll be much better listening to me in English. Um, uh, so, and it doesn't look like many of you even have your headphones on, which uh, um, I, you know, I, is always humbling for me. <laughs> uh, so I apologize for not being able to do this in German. Um, and I also, may I also say thank you also uh, you know, to the foundation, to Henning von Bargen, especially for inviting me and facilitating my, my being able to come. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about what I plan to, to do. Um, in a way, what I want to do is I, I not only just want to talk about the book a little bit, but I also want to talk about why we did it, uh, why we did this book the way we did, um, why we wrote a, a book that you know ha- looks like it has a kind of a football diagram on it. Um, and basically, our, our plan in this, and, and as you said, you know, one of the things that's important to us is that you know, we do it in a way that's somewhat humorous to make sure that people understand that that whole idea that feminists are not funny is entirely incorrect. Um, that was important to us. Um, but basically, it's, 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 to, it's to make an argument, in a sense, that what feminism has achieved among women um, often doesn't resonate for men. Most men don't think about it, don't think it's about them, and so it remains distant, it remains foreign, it remains confusing, it remains potentially threatening to men. So our job in this book, in the way that we wrote it, was basically to, to say, listen guys, it's not that scary. You too can understand this. It's not, you're, it, not every feminist is angry at you personally. Um, and most important, and this is the point that I'm going to, the argument that I will make uh, in my remarks tonight, it's not only, not, not only it's, it's, it's also um, a good thing that the way we think about gender equality uh, the way we've come to think. Now, Michael Coffin is from, from Toronto in Canada. I'm from the States. But I think the way we, in, um, in, in many of the industrial societies in Europe and in North America, think about gender equality, we are told to think of it as a zero-sum game. So what men think very often is that if women win, men are going to lose. Um, and, and this is typical because we live in a culture that basically has told us, you probably all know this, that women and men are from different planets. And, you know, men are from Mars, women are from Venus. And you probably have, you know, read your, your share of these kinds of, of, of arguments. Did you know, by the way, that John Gray's book, Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus, is the best-selling self-help book in the history of the world? <laughs> that book sold 17 million copies. Just that book. That's men are from Mars, women are from Venus. That doesn't include the, you know, Mars and Venus in the boardroom, Mars and Venus in the bedroom. There, there should be someday Mars and Venus in the bathroom. Um, it doesn't include the DVDs, board games, pen and pencil sets, uh, videotapes, audio tapes. Uh, um, there was a game show on TV for a while. Um, and my favorite part of the Mars and Venus empire, the therapy franchise. You can be trained, really, I'm not, I'm not joking, you can be trained to do Mars and Venus therapy. Um, it takes two days. Um, and you go to, you know, corporate headquarters in Northern California, where else, and, and you get trained to do it. And then at the end, you come back, you hold out, you hang out a shingle that says you do Mars and Venus therapy, uh, and you send, you know, 10% back to headquarters, sort of like a tithe. And so... Um, but the thing about that book, which everybody knows the argument, and it's kind of the fallback default position in most cultures, is that men and women are so fundamentally different that we might as well be from different planets. And therefore, any amount of communication between women and men is an event of intergalactic proportions. <laughs> now, my argument is a little bit different than that. And so my argument... Oh, is, yes. So my argument is that women and men's interests are similar, that men and women are more alike than we are different, that we're all from planet Earth. I would love to write a book called We're All Earthlings, but I don't think that will sell 17 million copies because I think there's something 
there's something in our culture that makes us want to believe we're fundamentally different, even though all of the available evidence suggests otherwise. Now, I want to make what, – what this book does is it tries to make that argument politically. It tries to say that the interests of women and the interests of men are similar. And that's kind of the case that I want to make to you tonight by talking a little bit about the book. So let me first start, start I think, where any conversation about, um, about gender – uh, it, these days starts, which is, you know, if you want to talk about where men are at, you have to start in a way by talking about the enormous changes in women's lives. Um, because that's really, I think, where this conversation begins. So I'm going to, and I'm, I'm going to illustrate this. I have some, you know, some illustrations, some cartoons and some other sort of various sorts of illustrations that I'll show you. But I also want to read one or two short entries from the book to give you an idea of what we, what we are trying to establish. So the first one I'm going to read uh, for the translator. Thank you. Um, uh, I don't know how you do it, I'm, I have to admit. Um, it's miraculous to me. Um, but the, So the first one I want to read is it's called Autonomy. And the book, by the way, lists, you know, goes through the alphabet. You know, I figure we want to really do this easily, simply for guys. So we, the Guy's Guide to Feminism starts with A... Uh, and goes to Z, and we have entries for each letter of the alphabet. And so, you know, we sort of take a very systematic, here are all the issues that women have raised, all the issues that, you know, and, and here's how we can think about them. Here's how you can support them. And the argument that we make, of course, is why you should support them is, of course, because it's good for you, too. It is in your interest to support feminism as a man. And that's the case I want to make to you, so you'll hear that. So... Here's the, here's the, uh, the uh, entry on autonomy. Imagine that you couldn't vote or couldn't go to college. Imagine that you couldn't work, or when you did, you couldn't join unions or hold certain jobs. Imagine that you couldn't serve on juries or hold public office. Imagine that you were prohibited from driving a car or from having a checkbook or a bank account with your own name on it. Imagine that stereotypes about you were the basis for discrimination in employment, housing, and education. Imagine that you couldn't own property in your own name. Imagine that in the eyes of the law, you were property. Imagine that you were afraid to walk on the streets of your own town or city, afraid to stay late at work or work late in the library, afraid to walk alone to your car in the parking lot. Imagine if you even felt afraid in your own home. Imagine that everywhere you turned, everywhere you looked, your body was being used to sell things, from automobiles to stereo equipment. This was the situation for women for most of the last two centuries. And it was against this that women has been, have been fighting. And boy, have they been successful. Most of those rights have been won, except, of course, the ability to live without the fear of violence. Feminism is a political ideology that fights for the rights of women to be treated equally, without discrimination, and to make their own decisions about how they will lead their own lives. The idea of autonomy is the heart of feminism. The radical idea... This is a quote, the radical idea that women are human beings, unquote, as one feminist writer put it. Autonomy women, means women can choose to become what they want to become and to be safe in following their own path. Is this really such a radical idea? We don't think so. It's nothing more than what men take for granted as our inalienable right every single day. We believe, we believe that men should support women's autonomy because we believe in the rights of individuals to make their own choices about their lives. We believe that men care about the women in our lives, and we want our wives, our mothers, our daughters, our sisters, our friends, our lovers, our colleagues, and our workmates to be happy, safe, and fulfilled as human beings. More than that, it will benefit us as men. It's more fulfilling and, frankly, more fun to be with people who are independent and strong, not supposedly weak, helpless, and dependent. It takes away some of the burden men often have to feel to feel like we're in control, make the decisions, be the provider, and know where we're going without asking for directions. Now, the thing about that, that's the entry, that's the entry on autonomy. Now, the thing about that is that if I were to say that, to, if I were to present feminism to my students today, 21, 22-year-old undergraduate women at my university, they would say, well, of course, but, you know, feminism, they say, this is 21-year-olds now in, in the States would say, feminism was your generation's issue. You know, this was really important for your generation. And thank you very much because we won. 
We can now do anything we want. We can be anything we want. And, you know, and so thanks, but it's over now. We don't really have to think about it. Five years later, after they graduate and they've been in the workplace, they come back and go, you know what, you were right. <laughs> but students really do believe that, you know, that the whole world is available and, and possible to them. Now, this argument, so this, this is the first thing that I want to talk about, is this idea that feminism changed women's lives, that women's lives have changed utterly in the past half century, and thanks to, and thanks to the women's movement. Let me point to four ways in which women's lives have changed fundamentally. The first is really obvious. Women made gender visible. We now know that gender is one of the organizing principles of social life, one of the foundations of your identity. Let me tell you, 40 years ago, 50 years ago, we didn't know that. 50 years ago, if you went to graduate school and said you wanted to study gender, there was not one course you could take. In fact, in my field, in sociology, if you went 50 years ago, if you went to graduate school and said, I want to study women, there was one course you could take. It was called Marriage and the Family. For years, that was like the ladies' auxiliary of the social sciences. Today, of course, there's women's studies courses, gender studies courses on every campus in the country. Women made gender visible. Other areas of change in women's lives. The workplace. Women have entered the workplace in unprecedented numbers in the past half century. Today, half of the labor force in the United States is female. Third is the balance between work and family. Not that long ago, women believed that they had to choose between having careers and having family lives. Not so my students today. My students today believe that they can balance work and family, that they can have fa you know, careers and warm, loving, supportive families to come home to. This phrase, have it all. You know, can women have it all? Can they have exciting, glamorous careers outside the, outside the home and warm, loving families to come home to at night? And the answer to that is, of course, no. Women can't have it all because men do. We're the ones who have the careers outside the home and the warm, loving, supportive families to come home to because women do the second shift. Women do the housework. Women do the child care. We have it all. So if women are going to truly be able to balance work and family, we men will have to do something different, and I will return to this. Now, the fourth area of change that I'm going to talk about, and I will talk about this tonight uh, to hope to keep you all awake, um, is, is sex. Now, this is the hardest one for men to, to figure out because we thought the sexual revolution was all about us. I mean, look, the sexual revolution promised more access to more partners with fewer commitments could you come up with a more masculine definition of a sexual revolution than that? But if you look at the mountain of sex research data that has been collected over the past 50 years or so, there's only one conclusion you would come to, and that is it's women's sexuality that's changed, not men's. And the easiest way to describe this change in women's sexuality is to say women today feel entitled to pleasure. Women know that they can like sex, want sex, go for it, get horny. And I'm not talking about some bohemian enclave in, say, Berlin or Greenwich Village. Or, I'm talking about mainstream, you know, Victoria's Secret wearing mall going women. Most American young women, college women know that they are entitled to pleasure. This is revolutionary. You don't have to convince men of this. So these are four areas of change. And they're big ones, right? Identity, work, family, and intimacy. These are four big areas of change in women's lives. So one has to ask the question, well, while women's lives have been changing so quickly, so much, what's been happening with men? So, and here, this is a really interesting thing. We were just talking a few minutes ago about this. 25 years ago, when I first started teaching, um, I would ask my women students, what does it mean to be a woman? And they would give me your traditional feminine answer. Well, you have to be nice. You have to be quiet. Smile. You know, don't make, ar you know, don't argue. And you'd ask the men 25 years ago, what does it mean to be a man? And they would say, John Wayne. <laughs> now, I ask the women, what does it mean to be a woman? And the women say, I could be anything I want. I could be a brain surgeon, an astronaut, a soccer player, a mom, anything. And you ask the men, what does it mean to be a man? They go, Arnold. That is to say, the definition of femininity has changed utterly, 
and the definition of masculinity has changed relatively little. So let me talk then. First, let me say, what is that ideology of masculinity, the John Wayne to Arnold model? And then talk a little bit about, get inside what I think of as the, the reason that feminism has, impo- has important resonance for men. Well, one psychologist came up with, to describe this ideology of, of masculinity, one psychologist came up with the four basic rules of masculinity. So if any of the men in this room are having any doubts or questions, just memorize these four rules, do them all the time, that's really important, and you'll be all right. Um, these are all idiomatic expressions, so I hope they translate in, in, re- relatively easily for you. The first one, the number one rule of masculinity. Just get this one right, okay? No sissy stuff. <laughs> you can never do anything that even remotely hints of the feminine. Masculinity is the relentless repudiation of femininity. That's rule number one. Rule number two, be a big wheel. We measure masculinity by the size of your paycheck. Wealth, power, status. Um, We have this bumper sticker in in, in the States that uh, some of you may have seen. It, it, It says, he who has the most toys when he dies wins. Right? Well, that's the second rule. Be a big wheel. The third rule, be a sturdy oak. A tree, right? What makes a man a man is that he's reliable in a crisis. What makes him reliable in a crisis is that he resembles an inanimate object. You know, a rock, a pillar. That's the third rule. And the fourth rule, give him hell. Exude an aura of daring and aggression. Live life out on the edge. Take risks. Go for it. Those are the four basic rules of manhood. Now what I want to do for a few moments is I want to take those rules and I want to look at them through the lens of the changes in women's lives. And the first thing I want to talk about is why it is that when we say women made gender visible, gender remains relatively invisible to men. Most men don't think about it. Most men don't know that gender is as important to us as women understand it is to them. Most men think, you know, when you hear hear the word gender, what gender do you think of? We're going to have a gender seminar. Seminar on women. So uh, most men don't think about this. Why not? Well, let me tell you my own story about how I first started thinking about this. This is a story that takes place about 30 years ago when I was a graduate student. And um, it's a story that will be so obvious that it couldn't take place today for very obvious reasons once I tell you. But 30 years ago, I was a graduate student. And you know how graduate students get. They get all excited about all these new ideas and they run around and go, oh, did you see this latest article? So somebody said one day, you know, there is an explosion of writing and thinking in feminist theory, but there's no courses yet. So we did what graduate students typically do. We said, let's have a study group. We'll get together once a week. We'll read some text. We'll talk about it. We'll have a potluck dinner. So each week, 11 women and me got together. (laughs) We would read some text in feminist theory and talk about it. And during one of the meetings, I witnessed a conversation between two women that changed my life forever. One of the women was white and one was black. The white woman said, this is the part that's going to sound so anachronistic now, 30 years old now. The white woman said, all women have the same experience as women. All women are similarly situated in patriarchy, and therefore all women have a kind of intuitive solidarity or sisterhood. And the black woman said, I'm not so sure. (laughs) Let me ask you a question. So the black woman says to the white woman, when you wake up in the morning and you look in the mirror, what do you see? And the white woman said, I see a woman. And the black woman said, you see, that's the problem. Because when I wake up in the morning and I look in the mirror, she said, I see a black woman. To me, race is visible. But to you, race is invisible. You don't see it. And then she said something really startling. She said, that's how privilege works. Privilege is invisible to those who have it. 
It is a luxury, I would say, to the white people sitting in this room not to have to think about race every split second of our lives. Privilege is invisible to those who have it. Now, you'll remember I was the only, um, I was the only man in this group. So when I heard this, I kind of went, oh. And someone said, well, what was that reaction? And I said, well, um, when I wake up in the morning and I look in the mirror, I see a human being. I'm kind of the generic person. You know, I'm a middle class white man. I have no race, no class, no gender. I'm universally generalizable. Um, So I like to think that was the moment I became a middle class white man. The moment that class and race and gender were visible to me for the first time. And that is really important because that was the first moment that I began, became aware of what I had not, yet, had not been seeing up until that point. Now, I wish I could tell you, just as a, as a footnote to this, um, I wish I could tell you that that discussion ends uh, 30 years ago in that, conversa- in that little conversation. But I was reminded of it rather recently. Um, I have a colleague at my university, and she and I both teach sociology of gender. So when she teaches it, I always give a guest lecture for her, and when I teach it, she gives a guest lecture for me. So I, I was at her, um, I went into her class a couple years ago, a really big room, 300 students. I walk into her class to give a guest lecture. One of the students looks up and says, oh, finally, an objective opinion. <laughs> All that semester, whenever my colleague, my female colleague, opened her mouth, what my students saw was a woman. I mean, if you were to stand up in front of my students and say, there is structural inequality based on gender, you know, in, in, in the United States, they would say, well, of course you'd say that. You're a woman. You're biased. When I say it, they go, wow, that's interesting. Is that going to be on the test? How do you spell structural? So, <laughs> so I, I hope that, I know that we're, we're broadcasting into the other room also. I hope that those of you in the back can see. This is what objectivity looks like. <laughs> You know, disembodied Western rationality (laughs) would be me. Um, (laughs) That's, by the way, just as for those of you who are who who don't have a Y chromosome, let me explain. This is why we wear ties. Because if you are going to embody disembodied Western rationality, you need a signifier. And what could be a better signifier than disembodied Western rationality than a garment that at one end is a noose and the other end points to the genitals? (laughs) This is mind-body dualism right here. That's how we know. (laughs) Aren't you glad you didn't wear a tie tonight, honey? (laughs) You didn't know this was a prop. (laughs) So... All right, now, so this is why I think invisibility is important. And this is the kind of thing that we talk about when we talk about men's, about privilege. Um, this is another entry uh, in, the, in, uh, in, the, uh, in the book, um, just about some of the privileges that men get. And I'm, I don't even need to read them to you. These are some of the privileges that men get just by virtue of being men, without having to do anything to earn it. It's not like we're, we were bad people and we're uh, you know, taking for ourselves all of this. This is stuff we get just because we are men. Uh, and that, I think, is really important for us. We have to talk a little bit about that privilege being unearned, unasked for, but nonetheless conferred upon us. Now, that means that breaking gender visible is political because it means making privilege visible. Um, but... I'll just show you this for one more moment and then show you. So this is what I got <laughs> as an email attachment. Last, this, is the, this is something that's like both very flattering and not a little bit creepy. <laughs> so this, this graduate of a Canadian university um, sends me an email saying, I just graduated from my university and I wanted to give myself a present you know, as for graduation, and I'm sending you a photograph of it. That's the photograph. My words, <laughs> indelibly placed on her arm as a tattoo. I mean, at least it doesn't say, like, Michael. Forever. 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 So, I, as you can see, like, I was thinking, wow, that's flattering. Ooh. <laughs> it's like, 
it's a little creepy to have your words indelibly tattooed on somebody. At least I didn't put quotes around it and put my name on it. Um, but there it is. But here's a better illustration of it. Actually, Lou, I think it was more than just my being in the right place at the right time. I think it was my being the right race, the right religion, the right sex, the right socioeconomic group, having the right accent, the right clothes, going to the right schools, etc. That's a little bit about what privilege means. It means that the inequalities that we experience, that, that we observe, are not the result simply of individual volition. That means that when feminist women have been angry at inequality, it's not that they're angry at individual men for having chosen this. But once it's revealed, to choose not to intervene, to choose not, to, not is to perpetuate it. That's my first, my first argument. Now, my second one is, why is it that men resist? Now, I'm going to move to the second area in women's lives uh, changing, and that is the workplace. And I'll tell you another story about how I came to think of some of these kinds of issues. Um, because it's not just making privilege visible um, that, that, that we're talking about when we talk about making feminism accessible to men. There's also something else, and I, just want, I think I can illustrate this by telling you about another, TV, you know, another uh, uh, experience in my own life. Um, some years ago, I was on a TV talk show uh, you've all heard of it, you know, black female host came out of Chicago. Um, and the thing, let me just say, we academics don't often get invited to be on talk shows because the talk show format is very polarized and very heated now. You know, it's yes, no, us, them, black, white. And what do academics do? We get up and we go, well, it's a little more complicated than that. <laughs> you know, that is really bad TV. <laughs> Um, so it's very rare to get invited to these kinds of shows. But there I was on Oprah, uh, opposite four, let us call them, angry white men. They were four men, not unlike the men you were describing, the ones in, in, the, in the newspaper as well. These were men who believed that they are, that white men today are the victims of reverse discrimination. That they were qualified for jobs, qualified for promotions, that they didn't get, and boy were they angry about it. And so they, had all, they were th there to, to talk about their grievances, how they were the victims, and then I, I was supposed to like, be the balance to this uh, and, and comment on it. Now, the reason I'm telling you this story is I want you to hear the title of this particular show. And the title was a quote from one of these men. They all told their stories. Um, and one of them said, and this was the title, a black woman stole my job. And then they told their stories about how they were qualified for jobs, qualified for promotions. They didn't get them, and they were angry about this. And so then Oprah turned to me, and I don't know, if it, did, have any of you actually ever watched the Oprah Winfrey Winf show? She was really quite, this was a particular genius that she had. She could be simultaneously admiring and condescending. She said, so, so what do you think about that, Professor. <laughs> And I said, oh, I have just one question for these guys um, about the title of the show, A Black Woman Stole My Job. And it's actually a question about one word in the title. I want to know about the word my. Where did you get the idea it was your job? Why isn't the title of the show A Black Woman Got The Job or A Black Woman Got A Job? Because without confronting men's sense of entitlement... We will never understand why so many men resist gender equality. We think gender equality will be a loss for men. We think it's a zero-sum game. We think this is a level playing field. So any policy that tilts it even a little bit, we think, oh my God, water's rushing uphill. It's reverse discrimination against us. Let us be clear. White men in Europe and the United States are the beneficiaries of the single greatest affirmative action program in the history of the world. It is called the history of the world. <laughs> so, that, but challenging, and so now, look, what, look, look, think about why we would not want to go there. To make gender visible means making privilege visible. To make privilege visible means making entitlement visible and then delegitimating it. So you can imagine why, like, let's not go there. So now what I want to do is I want to show through the, from the issues of the book some of the ways in which we, act, we actually have found that this is in our interest. 
to do so, that it is in our interest to embrace gender equality in, in public and in our private lives as well. And to do that, I'm going to turn to the third area of change in women's lives, the balance between work and family, and talk a little bit about men as parents. Um, I'm going to move to the entry on dads, page 31, for those of you translating while I'm talking like a New Yorker. Um, um, so uh, he says, uh, he, he's on his cell phone, he says, can I call you back? I'm creating happy memories of my childhood for my father, <laughs> which I particularly like. Um, <laughs> So, um, so here's here's the model. That, how, you know, here's the model of parenting that we've sort of inherited. My wife's about to have a baby, so I was wondering if you could make me work late for the next eighteen years or so. <laughs> the model of you know, but today, of course, young men are quite eager to be parents. We really want to be good parents. If you ask college-age men, Gen Y men, millennials, they expect to be equal parents. They expect to be really involved fathers. They expect to be much more involved than their own fathers were. And so how do we talk about this? How do we talk about this discourse about, about men being active parents? Well, we have this, we have this phrase, uh, which I'm sure you've, you've encountered as well, about you know, quality time. Have you, have you seen that? Um, well, here's how, here's how I think it's working out for a lot of guys now. Uh, first of all, Harrington, let me tell you how much we all admire your determination not to choose between job and family. And the reason I love this cartoon is, look at these guys in the sun. Do they look how admiring to you? Um, this is what happens to guys now. But the, but the data here are quite clear. Men today say they want to be better fathers. They expect to be, and they're putting in the hours. To do it. So, what does that mean? It means that we want quality time with our kids. And this is the response we'll get from our kid. Quality time? Do I have to? You know, you say to your, you say to your son, come home early from school on Friday. We'll get together. We'll go out, kick that soccer ball, and do some bonding. Your kid is going to say, oh, sorry, Dad, I'm busy, but I'll text you. You know, so I have actually become a big believer in quantity time. Not quality time. Quantity time is putting in the long hours, doing the routine household tasks that nobody gets to be, you know, father of the year. Nobody gets an award for. Um, I could say this autobiographically. How I discovered this was probably the 43rd time I watched Toy Story with my then six-year-old. And... You know, and he cuddles into me and he says, oh, daddy, this is so great. I love you so much. And what you get, you know, you're supposed to go, ah, right? <laughs> but what you understand at that moment, parent, how many of you are parents? You know this, right? Come on, how many of you are parents? Ad admit it. Okay. So what you know at that moment is that that would not have happened had you not also watched Toy Story 42 other times, Right? Um, there are some movies I have truly memorized. Um, so here's, here's what we say about fatherhood. Nowhere has feminism, this is the entry on dads, nowhere has feminism had a more wonderful impact on the lives of men than in our experience as parents. After all, feminism implores, encourages, and challenges men to be fully involved in parenting. It says we can do more than take our kids out for a special treat. We can actually be terrific parents. Most men have stood up and listened. Most new fathers we know want to play a much bigger role in, in, in raising their children than did their own dads or granddads. Sure, some of the work truly sucks, but it's the best thing that's happened to men since the invention of the TV remote. We still have our work cut out for us. In spite of these changes, women still do more child-rearing in most families. This has limited their ability to pursue careers. And it's also a total drag if both of you work outside the home and she's the one stuck with most of the work looking after the kids. And because children need all the attention they can possibly get, women also know that those children who do have fathers around will benefit from them being present and active so long as these dads are loving and nurturing. Now, given that, I'm going to now I'm going to skip the Norwegian data for, you, for, for this audience. And I'll go right to the entry on housework. So 
Balancing work and family requires not only shared parenting, but sharing the household chores. That is, housework and childcare. This is really kind of becoming an interesting phenomenon, and I suspect that this is equally true in Germany, where you would find equal numbers of young men saying, yes, of course I want to be a really involved father, and if you go to a playground here in Berlin any afternoon, you're likely to see a, lot, a significant percentage of the, of the parents there to be males. But here's what we're finding in, in the States. I'm a sociologist, so permit me to be a sociologist for a moment. When we measure people's family time, we are measuring housework and child care as a unit. So we ask how much housework and child care men and women do. And if you look at that data, you would see that men are doing somewhat, but not significantly more than they were doing 20 years ago. They're doing somewhat more. But the data aren't like off the charts. But so here's what's happening. That's an artifact of what we're measuring. What's happened in men's practices is that they have now separated housework and child care. And they're doing virtually no more housework and boatloads more child care than they were doing 20 years ago. And so what happens is dad is becoming the fun parent. Dad takes the kids to the park and they play soccer and they have a great time. And mom, meanwhile, makes the beds, does the laundry, makes the lunch that they come home to. And the kids come back and say, we had such a great time in the park with dad. He's such a good parent. So obviously this is a way that, that inequality becomes reproduced in practice, even though in theory men are saying and doing more, more housework and child care when seen as a unit. Now, what I want to say to you here, here's the, um, the last bit of an entry that I'll read to you. Um, it's the entry on housework um, for those in the booth. Um, so here, here's what – I'll just read you a couple of pa- paragraphs of this. Um, here's the thing about housework. It's work, you chowder head. Of course it's not all fun. Why do you think women have said they don't want to be stuck doing most of it? On the other hand, work or not – There's something about housework that's basic to being human. After all, housework is the way people take care of each other in everyday life. You're a man of action? Well, this is the action of caring for someone else and also looking out for ourselves, even if that action sometimes sucks. The problem has been and still is that women get stuck with doing much more of this. Yes, many of us work damn hard to equalize housework, but overall, Even in households where both partners work outside the home, women do the large majority of it. One study from the National Survey of Families and Households shows that among married couples, men do about 30% of the housework, 14 hours per week, compared to 31 hours per week for their wives. Now, this is an increase from the 1970s when men did 10%, so it is going up. Perhaps you can say there are good anatomical reasons why we don't do more. This is the Mars and Venus one. Why don't we bake? Imagine it getting caught in the oven door. And don't get us started on the dangers of vacuuming. Then again, maybe not. There's nothing natural about men copping out of housework. After all, many men pride themselves at being good with power tools, except sewing machine food processors and vacuum cleaners. And if men are so biologically ill-equipped to sew or cook, How come the most famous surgeons and chefs are all male? So it's great news that we're seeing fantastic change in North America, parts of Europe, Australia, and among other couples here and there around the world. Until the rise of feminism, most women were convinced that it was their lot in life to clean up not only after themselves, but also after the men in their lives. Particularly with the rise of two-income families, the absurdity of this assumption is ever more apparent. Women working outside the home said clearly they didn't want to get stuck doing the second shift while their guy could relax or play or focus on work or studies at night and on weekends. This was just plain unfair. Not only unfair, but actually turns out to not be so good for men. The data here are pretty impressive, so I'm going to share it with you. There's two studies that I want to talk about. Really interesting. Um, There's a psychologist at the University of Washington named John Gottman. Um, He's the the marriage doc, and you can Google him. uh, You know, just Google the marriage doc. Um, He's and he's a psychologist, and he you know, and he predicts if he if if he meets a a married couple and talks to them, he says for 30 seconds, 
he can tell you whether they're going to stay together or not. Right? Yeah, right. Pretty impressive. Or maybe just a little bit exaggerated and hyperbolic. Okay. So anyway, he has, he, he's done this study in which he found that the happier, that, that the more egalitarian the couple, the more equal the couple, the happier they both are the more likely they are to stay together. That couples that are more equal are more likely to stay together. This is what he finds. So, now I'm a social scientist, so how would you measure this equality? Right? Well, there's some sociological research on this. The sociological research basically finds that there are two variables that predict equality in a marriage. One variable is Remember, we're talking about cross-cultural research from you know, pre-industrial cultures to the most industrial. Is Does the woman own property in her own name after marriage? So some measure of women's economic autonomy. That's what you'd be looking for. Some variable on women's economic autonomy. The second variable, much more applicable in, in, in advanced societies, is this. How much time does the man spend doing housework and child care? The more housework and child care he does, the more equal the relationship. So why should he do it? Here's what the data show. When men share housework and child care, so now, now we're not into making privilege visible. Now we're not into any entitlement stuff. Now we're making the case that gender equality is a good thing for us. Okay, so here it is. Number one, when men share housework and child care, their children do better in school. When men share housework and child care, their children have lower rates of absenteeism. They are less likely to be diagnosed with ADHD. They are less likely to teach, see child psychiatrists. They are less likely to be put on, me, on prescription medication. They are less likely to be absent. They are more likely to be high achieving. They are more likely to say they're happier. So, when men share housework and child care, their children are happier, healthier, and do better in school. All right, maybe that's not enough of a motivation for men. When men share housework and child care, their wives are happier. Duh. <laughs> yeah. Um, but not only that, their wives are healthier. Their wives work out more. They have more, more time. Um, they, they are less likely to see a therapist, less likely to be diagnosed with depression, less likely to be taking prescription medication. So when men share housework and child care, their wives are happier and healthier. Okay, maybe that's not enough of a motivation for men. When men share housework and child care, the men are healthier. They smoke less, they drink less, they take recreational drugs less often, they are less likely to see a psychiatrist, they are less likely to be diagnosed with depression, they are, le they are more likely to go to a doctor for routine screenings, but less likely to show up in the emergency room. When men share housework and child care, the men are healthier. They're not only healthier, but they are happier. They report much higher rates of, of marital satisfaction, much lower rates of depression. Okay, maybe that's not enough of a motivation for men. When men share housework and child care, they have more sex. Of these four really interesting findings, which one do you think Men's Health magazine put on its cover? Housework makes her horny. <laughs> Parentheses, not when she does it. Uh, taking five minutes in the evening to take out the trash and load the dishwasher could improve your marriage and your sex life. In a recent study of 3,500 people, researchers at California Riverside found men who perform the most chores around the house are extremely sexually attractive to their partners and have the best relationships with their children. It also makes wives feel loved and more like equals which increases their interest in sex, says John Gottman, the marriage doc. <laughs> so there it is. Men have more. Now, those of you who are in relationships, those are the men in this room who are in relationships, let me be very clear about this data. This data was collected over a really long time in the aggregate. I don't want you to be sitting out there thinking, hmm, okay. So, baby, I just dropped the kids off at school, and now I'm going to the grocery store, and then I'm going to go home and unload the car. Am I making you hot? <laughs> Washing the dishes tonight is not going to... This is data, as I say, collected over a really, really long period of time. 
But, but it does lead, I believe, to an important, uh, an important conclusion as well. And that is that feminism, gender equality in our relationships, is not about them versus us, but it is a win-win for both women and men. Um, that women have, and, but I, I will also say um, that it leads to a certain amount of arrogance, I suspect. But it's also led, I don't know if any of you have seen this, but it's also led to a whole new genre of pornography. So you didn't think I was going to be, you, you didn't expect me to be showing you pornography at the end of my talk, but here it is, porn for women. <laughs> well, I can't offer you any solutions, but I am a good listener. <laughs> Breakfast is on the table, and I'll have your outfit ready in five minutes. <laughs> Aren't you getting turned on? Come on. <laughs> and this is my favorite. As soon as I finish the laundry, I'll do the grocery shopping, and I'll take the kids with me so you can relax. <laughs> Now, this is a little bit, you know, this book by, by, by published, the porn, porn for Women by the Cambridge Women's Collective, um, does, get, does suggest something, I think, important. And that is, the argument that we make in Guy's Guide to Feminism is really quite simple. Is that women have identified issue after issue. If you disaggregate these and you present them, most, most college-age women today... If you ask them, do you support this, 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 and this, if you took the you know, feminist top ten policy initiatives, they would all agree with all of them. If you ask them, are you a feminist, they would say, no. I, I, I like wearing makeup. I like men. I like shaving. All of these, you know, this, the stereotypes about what feminism means has become so pervasive. The same thing is true of men. If you presented to men of college age, feminist top ten policy initiatives, most college age men would agree with them as well. So this is not about the policies. This is about our personal lives. It's about claiming the name, owning the fact that this name sort of is an umbrella for all of those different ideas and all of those policies. And the argument that we tried to make in Guy's Guide to Feminism is really quite simple. A, feminism is understandable by men. It is, not so, 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 uh, it is not so complex and difficult. Second, that it is not a, a Mars-Venus issue, that it is in fact an Earthlings issue, and that the very things that women have identified as the things that will make their lives better are the very things that we men need to make our lives better as well. And that's why guys not only need a guide to feminism, but that's why in fact we need feminism itself. Thank you very much.